Hello, hello everyone. Good morning and uh, welcome to our second, or sorry, our third uh, technical training workshop. Uh, we're very excited to be presenting today because um, we are going to be talking about transport refrigeration. Uh, we had our first technical training workshop uh, about half a, half a year ago, we are, where our uh, speakers were speaking about commercial refrigeration technologies, advanced technologies for commercial refrigeration. We also had a number of uh, few expert speakers speaking about uh, industrial refrigeration. So that was uh, very exciting. And now we are very excited to have three very knowledgeable and key experts speaking about transport refrigeration specifically advanced uh, technologies for transport refrigeration using natural refrigerants, uh, incorporating uh, electric vehicles and, and uh, advanced technologies for insulation. And um, yeah, so we're very excited to get going with this uh, webinar this morning. So thank you again, uh, all of you for joining us. Uh, we'll get started here. We'll just be talking about the agenda. Uh, my name is Devin Yoshimoto. I'm the communications lead for the communicate for the so the Cold Chain Innovation Hub, and I'm here with my colleagues, Hilda Garibay and uh, Jan Dushek, the head of global partnership. Uh, Gilda, Gilda is our uh, project lead, and she'll be starting off with a welcome and introduction for the first 10 minutes. Um, and then Jan will be following with uh, speaking about the, our partnership program that we are running right now. And then we're, we're going to be following that with a presentation from Suresh Dure Sami uh, from Carrier Transicold. And then we have uh, Bong Cruz from Centro Nippon Fruhof Cooltech, who will also be speaking. And then finally, we'll have uh, Philip Tanowski from uh, Product Blocks uh, speaking about an R290 transport refrigeration unit for light commercial vehicles. We'll also be following that with a QA, uh, opening up the floor for questions and answers for uh, ourselves and our speakers. And then we'll have a short closing at the end. So, uh, a two hour, two hour webinar today. Uh, uh, so thank you again for joining us. So we'll start with uh, with Hilda. Hilda, if you are with us right now, can you hear me? Hello, good morning, everyone. So good morning, Hilda, yes, uh, go ahead and take it away. Uh, I'll let okay. you, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, I'll let you share your screen. Okay, then. So good morning, everyone. I'm Hilda Garibay, the project leader of the food cold chain, uh, cold cold chain project in the Philippines. So I'll just give you a quick background of our project. So stay tuned. So uh, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization is implementing a project in the Philippines called Global Partnership for Improving the Food Cold Chain in the Philippines. It is funded by the Global Environmental Facility, uh, amounting to 2 million US dollars, plus co-financing around 25 million US dollars from other partners. The Department of Environment and Natural Resources, or DNR, is our government partner. Uh, and we have key executing partners here in the Philippines. We have the TESDA, we have the SHECA, which will be our uh, technology providers, and we have also uh, be partner with other financial institutions. So the goal of the project is to identify, develop, and stimulate the development of low carbon, energy efficient refrigeration, innovation technologies, and business practices in the Philippines for use throughout the food cold chain whilst increasing food safety and security. Through the project, we are aiming to establish a global partnership between the public sector, the private sector, and financial institution for promoting promotion of investment and support of best available energy efficient technologies and practices transfer. So the project will concentrate on the comprehensive transformation of the commercial, industrial, and transport generation system. That's why we are here today, this morning. So, Overall, we are one to address the impact of refrigeration to the global warming. And then number two is the food losses we are experiencing because of the lack of the facilities uh, regarding food cold chain. So we will uh, achieve that uh, objective through three, uh, three through our components. Number one is the policy and regulation assessment on the use of low carbon and energy efficient technology within the food cold chain. 
And then number two, we are doing awareness and capacity building on the use of energy efficient, climate friendly and safe alternatives in the food cold chain. And number three, we are doing technology transfer and establish partnership among key stakeholders. And of course, monitoring evaluation will be done throughout the project. So the awareness and capacity building and technology transfer will be facilitated through our cold chain innovation hub or the CCI hub. Uh, this will be the official platform of the project. It will serve as the project central ecosystem of technical resources, training, knowledge sharing, and stakeholder collaboration. It is expected that through CCA have new technologies made available in the country, partnership between key stakeholders established, and financial scheme to develop the bankable investment project put into practice. Of course, this is the one of the important aspects of the project to support those who want to transform their existing uh, facilities into more environmentally friendly. So uh, it expected that uh, the CCPI have, uh, anyway, so the CCI hub will uh, operating uh, both virtually through our website and our YouTube channel, and then the physical hub which will be established in TESDA. So, so please uh, keep uh, tune in to our, our uh, uh, in our website to know more of our project and to be updated on the events and our knowledge uh, knowledge material we will be updating. So that's my quick uh, project brief. So back to you, Devin. Thank you. Thanks, Gilda. Um, yes, our website, again, just for those who are interested, uh, cci-hub.org. You can go there to check out our resources, um, upcoming events, and uh, learn more about the project. So Hilda, thank you very much for introducing our project uh, to the audience. And uh, now I'm going to throw it over quickly to Jan uh, Dushek, who is the head of Global Partnership, who's gonna talk about more uh, about our activities for seeking industry contribution to the actual cold chain innovation hub facility. So Jan, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Devin, uh, for introducing the event as well as uh, our speakers today. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, and uh, I would like to just give a short update on uh, the event that we have organized uh, a couple of weeks ago, the call for industry contributions. So I'm very pleased to say that uh, we have um, already received uh, several uh, contributions from the industry, uh, including uh, equipment for the cold chain uh, technologies, retail, uh, we have uh, also received a contribution for the transport. So we're we'll very happy for this initial reaction. We welcome uh, the industry to get in touch and work with us as we would like to represent as many as, as possible sectors uh, in, in the cold chain that are relevant to Philippines, of course. So uh, we welcome uh, the, uh, the, the contributions and we, of course, are here to, to receive uh, the responses and, and respond to any, any question. So I will just uh, have a few slides to uh, go with you, Devin, could you please share the screen? Thank you. For a few minutes before we jump to our first speaker. So first of all, uh, just a short summary of the event that we have uh, run last time, industry contribution. So uh, what kind of equipment, what is the facility about? First of all, the, the purpose of the coal generation hub in Philippines is to showcase the low carbon energy efficient food coal chain technology from farm to fork. So the different functions and facilities of the coaching hub will serve precisely this function. To bring uh, the attention to the latest technology to offer the training and expertise and uh, know-how when it comes to handling the uh, new generation of, of coaching technologies. This, this is the ecosystem of technical resources, technology promotion, knowledge sharing, and uh, stakeholder collaboration. So uh, last time we have introduced in particular three different facilities or so three different function rooms uh, under the Coach Generation Hub. And I would like to give a short uh, summary uh, regarding these three uh, key functions. So the first off is our cold storage room when we will have a running equipment uh, for uh, training and demonstration of uh, both the medium temperature application as well as the low temperature freezer application. So we are open to receive the contributions from the industry on uh, these two uh, particular sectors. Training room uh, is another uh, room that will be equipped with uh, running 
uh, technology running systems. Uh, this room will be uh, in particular dedicated to retail technology. So I'm glad to uh, also uh, inform you all that we have received uh, the interest from the showcase manufacturers and we'll be proceeding with, with finalizing the layout of this room over the coming uh, weeks. Uh, we still have, of course, space for additional technology. So again, we welcome the, the contribution from the global industry to uh, take part in this project. The exhibit itself is the largest available space over 300 uh, meters square. There will be live and also exhibit only uh, systems, components. It's really the showcase uh, to educate, to bring together all the different stakeholders, including uh, end users and government to showcase the latest technology and increase the awareness. The workshop uh, will be, as mentioned before, a demonstration of farm to fork technologies, state of the art sustainable uh, food cold chain uh, systems and components and anything relevant to the whole, uh, to the whole sector uh, that would be then a part of the hub. So uh, we are seeking uh, not only uh, the actual equipment, but also uh, models that can be uh, that can be exhibited uh, when the size of the system is limiting. There can be different audiovisual uh, uh, ways to present information about the coaching and technologies, uh, about the, the, the new practices and establish uh, best practices in the industry. So uh, we are quite flexible in the form of contribution. And again, we are looking forward to working with all the stakeholders. Uh, to name uh, some of the uh, systems and components that we are uh, looking to, it's, it's not only the, the refrigeration system for retail and cold storage transport, it's the particular uh, components and tools and models. So here is just a, a brief overview of uh, specific examples of the technologies that we are looking for. I believe many of the, uh, the stakeholders involved in the sector will find their particular business are uh, mentioned here. Training is extremely important when it comes to new technologies uh, for food cold chain uh, sector, and we welcome the uh, contributions on the content relevant to CO2, R290, propane, and ammonia. Uh, addressing their specific uh, challenges, um, managing high pressures, flammability, toxicity, safe handling, and so on. So uh, we are looking for various training material that can be addressing these topics as well. As mentioned, uh, this, can, uh, this can range from online tools to software, uh, printed materials, uh, uh, virtual reality uh, you know, modules, and so on. So uh, certified courses are, of course, uh, welcomed as well. And finally, it's not only about technology and materials, it's very much about the experts. So for the companies that are not necessarily involved in manufacturing of technology on the components, we welcome their contribution in form of their expertise. Having an expert on the ground for three days to run a, a specific uh, training course for the local industry is extremely welcome and valuable contribution to the project. So we welcome the, uh, the expertise itself to be a form of uh, a contribution to the project. So why to contribute? Again, we see uh, there's, a, there's a wide range of, of, uh, of benefits for the partners. They will be officially recognized under the project. We will be uh, announcing the first uh, contributors uh, this month. Uh, we'll be announcing them on the website. We'll be making a dedicated section for the contributors on the project official website. So there is recognition with this uh, international sustainability initiative on, on a high level for uh, the private industry, for uh, the other uh, stakeholders involved as well. And of course, the local industry, uh, the local stakeholders will have the opportunity to train and to, to learn about the new technology. So that itself, I believe, is a very valuable opportunity for the manufacturers to have their technology associated with the, the training uh, for the new generation of these systems to be, to be installed and deployed on the ground. So the project itself uh, will, will help build the market for these technologies. So again, to be associated with this, uh, we believe is of uh, a very high value for, uh, for the industry. With that, uh, I believe I would like to uh, thank you for your attention and again, welcome you to, to reach out to us and uh, to, to uh, be part of this project, which we believe will, will play a very important role, uh, not only for Philippines, but beyond. So don't hesitate to get in touch. And with that, I'm very happy to uh, welcome our first guest and then we'll 
Uh, please take over for the introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, yeah, so you know we are excited to get started today with our, our, our uh, panelists. Uh, we have three expert speakers joining us today to talk about transport refrigeration. Transport refrigeration is one of the key parts of the food cold chain that we identified in our research as uh, needing a lot of support, uh, especially going forward for the future development of the industry in the Philippines. Uh, so our speakers are going to be talking about the whole range of transport refrigeration solutions. Um, everything from reefer containers to refrigerated trucks, like commercial vehicles. Um, so we're excited to welcome our first speaker today, uh, Suresh Dure Sami, who is the Associate Director of Product Management for Carrier Transit Cold uh, for Global Container Refrigeration. Uh, Suresh, good evening. Uh, you're joining us from the East Coast today uh, of the US. Uh, thank you for joining us. How, how are you? I'm oh, doing good. Uh... Thanks for giving us an opportunity, Devon. And also thank you for the introduction, uh, Gilda and Ian. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, go, go ahead and uh, take it away if you can share your slides. And uh, we're, we're really looking forward to, uh, to your presentation. OK, sure. Let me share slides. Let me see. Yeah. Are you able to see uh, most of the screen? Other yeah, than I guess some <laughs> screen. OK, good, go. good. good. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> as uh, Devin uh, introduced uh, me, I'm the associate director here for the product management in the global container group. And I'll take you through some slides um, which goes over our uh, natural line product, which is a CO2 refrigerant. And uh, I believe there will be time uh, in the end for questions. Feel free to um, ask questions. As well as in the end, I think there will be a panel discussion. Look forward to it. Uh, we operate uh, across uh, the entire cold chain from farm to fork. You might have heard the word farm to fork, uh, which is basically from the field where the produce is uh, harvested to the end user where they eat, cook, and eat the fruits or uh, 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 vegetables in the fork. That's, the, that's where the word comes. Uh, we carry them over the ocean and roads, and as part of the wider carrier refrigeration business, right down to cold rooms and even supermarkets, we refrigerate, refrigerate the cargo as well as track. We also uh, supply telematics to track the cargo and its temperature conditions and the reefer units. Uh, display protect temperature control products so they arrive fresh and safe uh, every single time. We have a large install base with more than a million of uh, transport refrigeration units operating in every part of the world. And on any given day, carrier transit called uh, container refrigeration systems help protect over a $9 billion worth of perishable fruits and medicine traveling across the ocean. That includes the frozen cargoes too. <clears throat> so going to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> go over the agenda, uh, just uh, uh, key main topics are uh, we'll cover the background and context of the transcol use of CO2 as a refrigerant in the refrigeration, refrigerator containers. Then uh, the key points for technicians regarding installation, operation, and ongoing maintenance of the units. Then uh, some case studies highlighting the main benefits, energy performance, challenges, and solutions particularly for Philippines for the cold storage uh, application that uh, was mentioned earlier by Jan. <clears throat> Outcome, uh, the next slide. Um, the outcome of uh, transition from uh, CFC to HFC. Uh, these acronyms, uh, some of you already know, so the CFC is chlorofluorocarbon refrigerant. HFC is hydrofluorocarbon refrigerant. Um, CFC, also called HCFC, because hydrogen is there in all these uh, carbon uh, molecules. So most refrigerants, the early ones, had uh, chlorine as well. That's the one uh, that the industry over the last two decades had worked hard and uh, moved away from, because the chlorine depletes the ozone in the Earth's atmosphere. So those refrigerants have already been moved out, and uh, uh, pretty much everywhere now we use HFCs. 
very few older units uh, use still continues to use CFC or HCFC. And uh, uh, this, uh, this has been very successful. Uh, if you look at the overall in the container uh, side of installed uh, units, uh, roughly 99%, uh, that's nearly every unit today uh, are operating with uh, uh, HFC, hydrofluorinated carbon refrigerants, which are uh, having zero ozone depletion potential but varying global warming potential. That's the one that uh, the environmentalists are more concerned now, now that the ODP refrigerants have been nearly removed. They're focused on uh, the global warming potential, which is basically uh, the contribution of the refrigerant to the global warming or heating of the earth with time. Uh, there's a total of about 1.4 million units in operation, just as a reference. So you can see 99% of them are HFC using HFC refrigerants. Uh, 134A as well as the 404A is used by one of the refrigeration manufacturer. Uh, they're all uh, HFCs and uh, 404A is, is a blend, basically. It's a blend of, uh, uh, of refrigerants. Uh, the, the main drivers that make these decisions uh, the parallel to challenges for today are uh, performance, which is basically efficiency of the unit, power consumption, cooling capacity, uh, and the next would be safety, uh, which are like uh, the refrigerant's uh, ability to not be flammable, uh, not be toxic, like ammonia is also used as a refrigerant, not in containers, but other products, as you know, they are toxic, so they have to be managed properly and contained. Then, uh, as I mentioned, lower GWP is a big driver nowadays. And uh, uh, the next is availability, easily available globally and not be very expensive. So you can keep the maintenance and operating costs low. And in the end, it's the cost, overall cost of refrigerant and also parts. Uh, some of the new refrigerants require unique parts due to its operating conditions or pressures. Uh, which I'll briefly touch later on. The next slide is uh, the FU, uh, EU F gas uh, regulation, European Union uh, fluorinated gas regulation. Uh, <clears throat> this applies since January 2015, and it replaces the original uh, F gas regulation adopted uh, early on uh, uh, 10 years prior to that. The caps are based on uh, 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 based on the different applications, and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, they try to uh, focus more on uh, uh, the ones that are uh, easy to uh, hit, easy to change. So you can see that uh, the key ones listed here: the domestic refrigerator ACs. Uh, and uh, multi-pack central commercial refrigeration. Those are the ones that uh, uh, they have a number of target of 150 with the different uh, timings. Most of them were, uh, uh, were did come into effect as of last year. The one that uh, we would be concerned more is equipment servicing bands, because uh, you can see uh, technically the container uh, mobile refrigeration units uh, do not come under these categories. Um, but servicing would still be a big impact uh, when you service the units. The next one of importance is the US uh, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the SNAP, which is basically acronym for Significant New Alternatives Policy. That's the US uh, it's a group which uh, governs the environmental regulations, EPA. They have, uh, for different applications again. Uh, they delisted HFC, uh, specific HFCs are their blends. They're given a certain model years. And one most of you may be familiar uh, are the motor vehicle cars. And uh, as you can see now, uh, majority of the cars in the US and even other uh, developed countries are slowly moving it to different refrigeration. They're moving away from 134A. And, uh, the main driver is uh, GWP, lower uh, global warming potential refrigerants. Uh, 
the US EPA published its uh, SNAP program and it proposes uh, the delisting and with a very aggressive timeline for the different applications shown here. Uh, some of them, as you see, proposed as early as 2016. And uh, uh, also they focus on uh, foaming. Uh, different foams use different uh, as a chemicals represents as a blowing agent to create the uh, small foams, which are unique to creating the insulator and insulation resistance properties of the foam. <coughs> uh, some more uh, uh, continuation of it is uh, proposals also mentions uh, some of the high GWP HFCs, such as the blends 404A and uh, 507A. Uh, the represents which have uh, uppercase letters are typically blends uh, per the ASHRAE nomenclature. So these two are blends. Uh, these two blends, they have a GWP, a high GWP of uh, about 4,000. Um, the first one is a, a blend of three refrigerant, 404A, and the other one is a blend of two refrigerants. And uh, <clears throat> as a reference, the 134A is a 1,300 GWP compared to 4,000 for these. Roughly. And uh, <clears throat> they did not, uh, these did not uh, get included in the proposal, but are under future consideration and industry feedback. These are used uh, mainly on uh, some of the cold storage warehouse and industrial refrigeration and also refrigerator transport, the 404A we mentioned earlier in a slide, uh, say about 15% of uh, units in the field uh, have that 404A IGWP. And lastly, um, Japan. They also published a proposed regulation for a variety of application with the GWP limits, including retail refrigeration, AC and automotive. Um, again, uh, transport refrigeration is not specifically included in this bucket, uh, but uh, again, like we said before, the servicing would uh, have an impact. <clears throat> in summary, uh, the impact to the container industry at the moment, none of these regulations directly affect the container equipment, uh, especially with respect to purchasing new equipments. But uh, what is very clear is that servicing uh, of the refrigerant uh, re of the units having the high GWP will become uh, very expensive. Um, and also the H HFC uh, availability, pricing and availability is going to be uh, uh, difficult. Um, so that's uh, that's a key takeaway. The industry needs to be prepared to move to the next phase of the refrigeration technologies and refrigerants. That's uh, definitely a key driver takeaway uh, from uh, a lot of these regulations imposing on different applications. The alternatives in front of us are either a more chemical blends, which are synthetic refrigerants, synthetic chemicals used as refrigerants, uh, like uh, like all these refrigerants that were discussed or natural refrigerants like air, water, CO2. Uh, let's uh, take a little bit uh, more uh, uh, review of uh, what the groupings of different refrigerations, uh, refrigerants are and how we go about selecting. Uh, ASHRAE is one of the key uh, established organization which uh, kind of uh, classifies and uh, defines some of these regulations uh, for refrigerants. Uh, they classify the refrigerant into two major categories, uh, as you can see X and Y grouping there in the axis, uh, based on the flammability of the refrigerant and its toxicity. And uh, <coughs> you can see, uh, they use a letter A, there's a two letter, two character they use. The first character is uh, for toxicity and the second character covers the flammability of the refrigerant. And you can see A1, A2, A3 and B1, B2, B3. And uh, uh, all the pretty much all the major refrigerants currently used are the A1, which are low toxicity and uh, no or very, very low flame propagation. It's practically no propagation is the grouping they do. Uh, so all the 404A, 134A, 
uh, used are all in that category. Uh, so is the natural refrigerant CO2. Uh, the one that's used and talked a lot about in automotive and currently used is the HFO, one, two, three, four, YFO. It's called HFO because it's a hydrofluoro oxygen uh, molecule. It's what uh, one, two, three, four, YF is made of. That's a very low GWP. It's about uh, one. Uh, that the only con issue with it is it's a, a medium flammable or low flammability grouping technically, but uh, because it is on the lower end, there's a lot of uh, discussions with the ASHRAE group and the refrigerant manufacturer, and they came up with a new classification, A2L, which is basically A2 refrigerant with the uh, lower bound of the A2 classification for flammability. So the one, two, three, four YF enjoys this new category, but still it is technically a flammable refrigerant. So according to the pressure equipment directive CE and other regulation, it's still coming into a higher category. So you'll have to do some additional protections and, and uh, uh, safety devices you have to put in. And uh, yeah, so there are a lot more regulations to prevent any flammable uh, flame uh, that are a fire that could occur if you use the refrigerant and it leaked and discharged into the contained atmosphere where humans are exposed to, or human can be exposed to. Um, the selection of refrigerant uh, used uh, are shown here. Um, the refrigerants, uh, all refrigerants pretty much, if you look on that right side triangle, all refrigerant pretty much. Uh, perform well from performance point of view. You can always optimize the system heat exchangers, compressor to get a good uh, uh, performance. Um, but uh, the next filter is uh, on the safety consideration, application safety, uh, where uh, a lot of them get uh, filtered out. Um, <clears throat> carrier has Several application, we make a lot of different units, air conditioning to chillers, to uh, refrigeration units. And we don't use same refrigerant depending on uh, uh, the application and needs and the safety, we use different refrigerant. For container refrigeration, our viewpoint is that a flammable refrigerant is not a su suitable alternative. We can go through some more detail shortly, but a high level, in a high level, the nature of application is uh, <clears throat> with being mobile with a wide variety of conditions, closed containers with relatively small amounts of free volume because cargo space occupies most of the box volume. It's a relatively large charge sizes that the system uses. Uh, you have a close proximity to potentially hundreds of thousands of units together. It does not make a good candidate, uh, particularly when you have electrical components um, that are in the unit. And finally, you have to apply the regulatory compliance uh, to focus on GWP, as you saw the regulatory standards uh, from uh, uh, US EPA to uh, FGAS, EU FGAS to Japan regulations. They all drive the GWP to, you, to a smaller number. Currently, uh, there is uh, uh, no synthetic refrigerant, which is A1 category. Uh, which is under uh, 500 uh, or 600 GWP. Um, so that is uh, that is the big uh, uh, problem uh, to drive into a low GWP with synthet synthetic refrigerants. We can see an example here to look a little bit more into the <coughs> into the uh, risk here. Here the flammability risk we will. Uh, consider. Uh, fire exposure risk is uh, basically uh, will be a product of presence of ignition source times the risk or probability of flammability uh, occurring. There is a factor called flammable concentration limit. It's the concentration in which the mixture of air and the refrigerant that leaked in can become flammable. There's always a range called lower flammable limit and upper flammable limit. So if your concentration is not within this range, uh, even if you try to put a flame, it won't ignite. Um, so there is a standard ISO standard 5149, which uh, covers the safety and uh, environmental use of uh, for a reference in good design practice. 
it's uh, currently being uh, revised, but uh, we can use the calculation here to understand. Uh, each refrigerant has a lower flammable limit. It's based on its inherent properties of the molecule um, being able to ignite with the air uh, exposure to air. From the refrigerant concentration limit that has been developed based on the maximum concentration allowed in a given space from a flammability perspective. The RCL is defined by the ASHRAE standard 34 for each refrigerant, they give you that. And the flammable concentration limit is uh, the lower uh, flammable limit converted to ppm or grams per uh, cubic meter. And it has a safety factor of four. It, uh, you, you, some may ask, why is it so high a safety factor? It's because when a leak occurs, you can assume, uh, take it for granted from safety purpose, that it will be a uniform mixture in the space. So uh, because of that, they use a factor of uh, four to be conservative that there could be some non uh, uniform mixture higher concentration. So that's where the factor comes. So if you look at a 40 foot container that is uh, typically 80% loaded with cargo, uh, there are related to uh, RCL recommended uh, uh, limits, values that are easily calculated and uh, they're shown here. Note for propane, which is a A3, uh, it's actually a B3, sorry. Um, so highly flammable uh, gas, the refrigerant. Uh, yeah, you can get a charge reduction of 20 to 30% because of the refrigerant properties. And we assumed, uh, say, even higher 50% reduction. However, even with that reduction, the RCL level is eight and a half times the strict standard and 34 times the standard allowed after applying this four times safety factor. Um, so you can see that even with the A2L refrigerant uh, category refrigerant, the RCL is about eight and a half times allowed by the standard. So it should be noted if you are using a 20 foot container, the volume is even smaller. So it gets even worse because of half the volume available. So in conclusion, A3, A2, uh, or even A2L refrigerant should not be considered in the container application. That is. Uh, that's our uh, conclusion based on these uh, risk calculation on flammability. Um, we'll uh, come to the natural refrigerant. Um, this is a layout of our unit, highlighting some of the key components here. Uh, the compressor is a special built. It's a two stage uh, for higher efficiency and uh, it's a variable speed, special purpose CO2 compressor. It's specifically made to meet the cooling capacity requirements for the broad range of uh, the container application. Um, and this efficiency is ensured uh, for the lowest possible power consumption and reliability to meet the heavy duty uh, cycles that it'll see in a marine and transport environment. The zero GWP insulating foam Ecomate methyl format is used uh, for uh, uh, used as a foam. And uh, it has a unique gas cooler. You might be familiar with the condenser on the high side. It's, it's exactly the same, but uh, we typically call gas cooler because uh, uh, the refrigerant doesn't condense to a liquid coming out of this uh, high side heat exchanger. So it enters as gas and leaves as gas. That's why it's called a gas cooler as uh, instead of a condenser. And uh, it has a special uh, tubing and fin uh, geometry and enhancements to maximize the heat transfer and have high efficiency. It also, in addition to that gas cooler, it has an intercooler, which also cools the refrigerant on the intermediate stage um, coming out of uh, uh, the first stage compression. And it also has a unique uh, flash tank function, uh, which separates the CO2 vapor and liquid and acts as a mid-stage heat exchanger for the economized cycle. Um, some people use the economizer uh, heat exchanger there, but the concept here we use is uh, using a flash tank. And it also has a custom variable speed uh, control compressor, uh, which varies the speed of the compressor um, to maximize the cooling and minimize the energy consumption uh, during its part load uh, in transit operation. And lastly, there's advanced control and software in the microprocessor 
which is specially uh, programmed uh, to operate in all the different conditions and precisely control the temperature for perishable and frozen cargoes. Uh, and also to add to it, uh, this uh, unit is 95% recyclable, the materials used here, and it's certified by UL, the underwriter laboratories in the US, Chicago. Uh, just to touch a little bit on the efficiency, um, directly comparing a natural line CO2 unit with our uh, industry top selling uh, uh, 134A unit, uh, the prime line unit for efficiency. Uh, this represents uh, the average efficiency use of a variety of conditions, including a couple of perishable cargo points, uh, which uh, are 14 and zero chosen, which is where majority of the cargos are like the banana, and tropical cargos, uh, pineapple, mortensi. And then zero C is quite a few cargos from grapes to lettuce and leafy vegetables, quite a few of them in the zero C uh, transport. So we used a couple of points here for comparison, as well as the most common frozen cargo, so minus 18. Uh, there's also a minus uh, 30 C or minus 25 C cargos screams and others, but majority of the cargos are carried in minus 18. So if you look at that, uh, compare them, you can see that a natural line outperforms uh, the prime line unit in the perishable conditions um, because of uh, the way the system is designed and the, the variable speed uh, unit we have there. Uh, for a large ship, a shipping line operating globally with a variety of cargo, the net power consumption uh, would be very similar for a natural line and a prime line. And uh, uh, here we discuss at a 25C uh, ambient because uh, that's a oops, that's a uh, that's a typical ambient uh, we see on a global uh, uh, region overall. If when you look at the weighted uh, ambient, it's uh, a typical region. So uh, a typical ambient uh, average you would see. So we use that as a representative uh, value to make the comparison. Uh, touch a couple of more points on the service uh, side and training. The service is very similar to our existing uh, prime line HFC models, um, and it, uh, uh, which is made up of a large percentage currently on the installed base prime line, uh, which is uh, nearly two third of the uh, re reefer units in the field now have a prime line. Um, we held uh, several of our uh, high quality service training programs for our uh, trial, uh, C trial customers. And the feedback from service technicians have been very positive. In fact, many of them commented that uh, the design is less complicated than expected, how the training has helped them to dispel some of the perceived risks, thinking that it's a very high pressure, difficult to work. Just for a comparison, uh, the HFC units are typically 400 to 500 PSI on the high side design pressure. The CO2 is 2200 PSI. Um, but a lot of the components are very similar, like the fans, fan motors, so fans, controller are very similar, just operate uh, at a different software. The training focuses on renewed foundation of the refrigeration fundamentals and working with the high voltage and pressures. Uh, specifically servicing and troubleshooting of the new system. They use very similar sensors. The pressure transducers are a higher pressure transducer, but a uh, lot of the temperature and other sensors are very similar. Uh, coming back, oops, sorry. Go to front. Uh, to my uh, last slide here, um, I'd like to uh, give some example of uh, static storage use because that's the key uh, point uh, I believe is uh, uh, Philippines uh, government is looking for here in this program. Um, we have a major customer and a, uh, a global customer who is uh, currently providing static storage uh, as a, and uh, using the natural line as a vending machine for a grocery pickup. So people in uh, developed countries, big uh, heavily populated uh, cities, they can just order what they want, grocery, which can be perishable or frozen. Uh, the unit is uh, modified, so it has two sections, uh, frozen as well as perishable in front. 
and it has some automated uh, mechanisms. So once you place an order, uh, service personnel, every day they come and then pack it uh, based on what your order is. They put it in uh, bins and uh, when you can drive up in your convenience, it will tell you that it's ready for pickup. You can come uh, after work or whatever on a convenient time and then scan and then it will deliver those uh, bins to your separate perishable, separate frozen bin, which the technician has loaded and marked. And uh, this is uh, becoming slowly uh, becoming bigger and bigger. They're starting to deploy in the US. They're doing, doing some trials with Walmarts. So if you look in their website, it's called Cleveron, like the word clever and OAN, Cleveron. And there's also another customer in UK they're using for a stationary storage for perishable and frozen cargo. They've been using it for the uh, last three, four years. It's also one other customer in Italy. They're also using it for uh, a stationary application. And there is one other uh, European customer is working on this for uh, usage of battery. They're developing their system uh, where uh, the unit can uh, be uh, the, where the batteries can be stored, the unit can protect it to keep it under 21C and uh, 21C temperature, so the batteries don't get hot because the performance degrade and uh, yeah, it cannot be charged. They use solar panels to charge the batteries, and these are placed in uh, some of the urban areas as well, um, and uh, also in remote areas where they can harvest uh, some solar energy. These are some of the practical applications uh, where they're. Uh, using it. Uh, that was my last slide. I hope I didn't run over. Um, so I'm open to uh, question and answers. Are there any Q&As? Open up to the team. Yeah, Suresh. Um, for Q&A, actually, would you be able to, to join us uh, at the end of uh, the Sure, sure. We can do that, definitely. Yeah, uh, yeah that would be great. We'll open up the floor to questions. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was, a, it was very interesting interesting presentation. I'd like to just ask you one follow-up question before we sure. uh, move on to the next speaker. Um, so, so the static storage use cases is, is very interesting and we see that you know it's being adopted um, by these, these companies in the US and in Europe um, and also in urban areas as well as rural areas. So I wanted to ask, um, you know, we see in the Philippines that there is um, a need for uh, cold storage, especially in the rural areas to help connect these production areas. To the to the urban zone, but really that first mile sort of range. What would what would the main challenges be? You think uh, to deploy these in more rural areas? I, I'd imagine you know weather and uh, and outdoor temperatures and, and power supply would be the main ones. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, yeah, I can uh, list a few things that comes to my mind. Um, a good power supply feed is definitely an important uh, thing. Um, uh, hopefully they have good quality power uh, because the unit uh, is, is still, it's nothing unique. It has to just follow the standard ISO 1496-2 requirement, uh, which the containers uh, use. So uh, basically it should have that and uh, sustained power. You can have single facing and stuff like that. So power supply is, a, is required and training I would, uh, um, expect uh, would be a challenge. We need to get the right people who are going to be using this to get trained and a service. Um, yeah, service personnel need to, um, the training should give them the required uh, things that they need to do to watch and monitor the units. And uh, uh, I would say you need to have somewhat developed uh, like a warehouse where you can pre-cool the cargo. Uh, that would be important because if you try to use the reefer unit, to do a pull down, it will take uh, it will take a more time. Um, so the refill units are designed designed to maintain temperature. So preferably a mature uh, um, warehouse available for the produce before you can load it to the reefer would be preferable. And uh, telematics, we also offer telematics mentioned early on. Uh, that would be helpful. It's recommended uh, if you can do it. You can constantly monitor and uh, if you can uh, set up. So you can get timely notification if there are issues with the unit or alarms popping up. Um, and also um, uh, the refrigerant availability for servicing, you need to have a refrigerant grade CO2. 
uh, which is not difficult. It, it's not like a medical grade, but it's a standard uh, refrigerant grade uh, as listed in uh, the AHRI 700. Um, it's a little bit uh, tighter purity than the standard refrigerants. It's a 99.9 .9 compared to 99.5 for 134A and other refrigerant. Uh, the water level purity is same as other, any other refrigerant, 10 ppm or less. Uh, vapor phase purity is same, so it's nothing major. So these are some of the things I would watch out for. I, I also got a couple of questions from uh, uh, Kirkland, Holland Bull. I don't know if you want me to address that now, Delvin. Yeah, no, it'd be great if you could actually. So we're gonna be moving on uh, to the next speaker for now, but yes, we are getting some questions. Um, if you have a chance to respond in the Q&A section, that would be great as well. But um, so let's uh, let's move on for now. Uh, Suresh, okay. thank you very much for your for your expertise. Um, we'll we'll see you uh, yeah. in a little bit. Yeah, I will cover some of these questions uh, in the end. Uh, thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's move on now to our next presenter, uh, Roberto Bong Cruz. Um, Bong, uh, good morning. You're joining us from the Philippines. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Good morning, Devin. Uh, yeah. Good morning, everyone, and to all those in the webinar. Good morning. Oh, yeah, perfect. Yes, um, Bong, you are the head of business development and corporate communications for Centro Manufacturing Corporation based in the Philippines. Centro is the largest manufacturer of truck bodies for the country's transportation and logistics center. Um, Centro also has recently launched a new joint venture called Centro Nippon Fruhoff Cooltech, where you are manufacturing and supplying refrigerated vehicles. So this is very interesting to get your perspective uh, on the industry. So we're very much looking forward to your presentation today. Uh, Bong, go ahead and uh, share your screen and um, let us know if you have any issues, but you are good to go. Thank you very much, Devin. Yeah, I'm be, I'll be happy to make a presentation on advanced technologies for transport refrigeration. Uh, our, my presentation would cover the following, the application of refrigerated advance in the in the uh, food supply chain in the Philippines, the government's uh, Palamigan and Bayan program or the cold storage for communities program, the application of refrigerated advance in COVID tra vaccine transport, major prospects for growth in the industry, the refrigerated transport solution, and the typical entry barriers for new products in the industry. So let me start off by, uh, by giving you uh, the, uh, the REFBAN, the role of REFBAN in the, in the food chain. It all starts off with uh, the farm and the fish ports. And these products are brought to the, uh, to the middleman. Now this middleman, he has access to the missing link in the supply chain that needs government intervention, the cold storage in the community. So those are the things that we don't have. So the middleman then brings that to the manufacturer or to his factory. And then from the factory, it's brought to regional warehouses in the provinces, either by air or by sea or by land. And then from the regional warehouses, it's brought to distribution centers in the cities. And then from the cities, it's brought to the outlets or supermarket or stores or what we call our last mile delivery. Go, sir. Okay. So realizing that there's a gap that needs to be filled, the government now came up with a, a palamigan ng Bayan program or what we call the cold storage in the community program. The, uh, there are three major players for this. And these are the, uh, the Department of Transportation with the Philippine Ports Authority and the Maritime Industry Authority under them, uh, the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Energy. Three major departments of the government are working together on this. To implement the project, they have refrigerated 40-footer container vans that, uh, of, the free, of the freezer type. Uh, that they deploy in communities. And these are made from the commissioned container vans donated by the shipping companies to the PPA and to Marina. If you look at the objective number two of this project, it says is to promote the use of refrigerated container vans as cold storage to store fresh fruits and vegetables, fish and meat products, and other perishable, perishable goods and supplies to address the concerns of food quality and productivity. So we are acknowledging here that with us this, a refrigerated a storage facilities, food quality would suffer and consequently productivity because the rate of uh, spoilage would be higher. So we really need to address this at the, at the first mile delivery portion of, our, of the supply chain. So here are pictures uh, 
this uh, this uh, person in the left photo in blue is the OTR secretary Art Tugade. And so far, as of last year, when they launched the project, they have deployed already 14 refrigerated container vans in 12 locations listed below. Our concern, which is a logistical challenge, is that there are 81 provinces, 1,631 cities and municipalities in 7,641 islands in the Philippines. So we still have a long way to go with respect to this program. With respect to transporting COVID vaccines, uh, let, me, let, let us see where we are using ref vans in, in the supply chain. It starts off in the source country where refrigerated vans are used to carry the vaccines from the factory to the airport. Once it reaches the Philippines, it's from the Philippine airport to NCR, the National Capital Region or Metro Manila Cold Storage. And then from there, it's brought to the airport for a shipment to the provinces or storage in other provinces within Luzon overland. And then from this provincial and city airports is brought to the provincial or city storage. And from the provincial or city storage is brought to the hospitals now, the health centers and vaccination centers before it is uh, in, uh, injected into the, uh, to the beneficiaries of the program, the COVID. Here's a uh, product, a sample of, that we did, an L300 COVID vaccine van that we, we made for uh, for a, for a dealership in the local sewer, and that's being used for the COVID rollout program. Let's look at other major growth prospects. The transportation and storage uh, industry in the Philippines is estimated to be to be at na, was estimated at 13 billion US dollars in 2019, and it's as accounted for 4 percent of the GDP over the last five years. And of course, if you can see, it has steadily grown over the last five years. If we look at the logistics industry, the Philippine logistics and warehousing industry will continue to grow as e-commerce surges because of the pandemic. Then all of, a lot of Filipinos have learned how to shop online, how to have their ordered goods delivered also home. Uh, home. That means door-to-door -door deliveries. So that's, uh, that, that has seen the growth of the e-commerce in the Philippines. And that study shows that uh, it is projected to grow at 8.2 to 8.8% 8 .8 rate for the period 2018 to 2024. And by 2023, it is expected to be at 970 billion or 1 trillion market by then. Let's look at these segments. Freight forwarding constitute 21.1% of the Philippine logistics industry. And the warehousing, Philippines is uh, blessed because it is, the, it is the most convenient docking location for supply routes, as it is essential, it essentially connects many export and import markets of different countries across the globe. So the Philippines is strategically located, so it's a good transshipment point. Express delivery market. By 2023, it is expected to be at 68.2 billion segment and uh, expected to have a 9% compounded annual growth rate from 2018 to 2023. And again, e-commerce logistics has showcased a steady growth over the last few years. We look at the, specifically the cold storage industry segment. The cold storage, based on a roadmap prepared by the industry, and submitted to the Board of Investments, they are targeting an increase of 10 to 15% annually, and that's equivalent to 50,000 pallets per year. The current capacity of the Philippine cold chain is approximately 400 metric tons or 500,000 pallets, according to the same roadmap. The same roadmap also says that there will be five investments in new storage, cold storage facilities, two in Luzon, one in Visayas, and two in Mindanao. If you look at the agricultural industry, the trend is that in 2021, it is expected to grow at also 1% at at it, uh, as it has done so during the last four years, 1% growth more or less. If you look at the retail market, the Philippine convenience stores, it registered the highest growth rate of 17% in grocery retail segment. If you look at the grocery retail segment market, that is basically our last mile delivery. So and it has consistently grown at around 9.1%. Convenience stores, these are the 7-Elevens, the Alpha Marts. This has grown 
by non point by 17%, the biggest growth among the segments. Supermarkets have grown by around 7%, hypermarkets and warehouse clubs by around 5%, and something unique, I think, to the Filipinos is the Sari Sari stores. These are the small uh, convenience stores that retail in sachets. It's grown at a uh, 2%. So knowing all of this, what, what we know in the industry, Centro, the biggest truck bodybuilder in the country, partnered with Nippon Fruhoff of Japan, also the leading bodybuilder there, and Fruhoff Mahajak of Thailand to form a joint venture company we call Centro Nippon Fruhoff Kultec Inc. We locally assemble on a pioneering status uh, we locally manufacture insulated sandwich panels using extruded polystyrene, and then we use this later to assemble refrigerated buns. If you look at our product compared to most of the competitors, we're going to use the extruded polystyrene foam or XPS uh, compared to injected polyurethane foam. Our interior and exterior panels would be aluminum sheet compared to fiberglass reinforced plastic, FRP. Our refrigeration system, since we are locally assembling, we can engineer our products to accommodate any brand available locally. Uh, most of the competitors now normally import completely knock down their, uh, their products, mostly from China. In terms of body models available, the same, we have dry van or the insulated dry van, we have the chiller van and the freezer van, and the thickness of the insulation panel, uh, all of us range from 50 mm to 75 mm to 100 mm. And then sizes available in terms of length, it could be anywhere from eight feet to 32 feet. The source, our source is that we're locally manufactured, the insulated sandwich panel and assembled using Japanese technology and process. Most of our competitors are importing them, be mostly from China. So if you look at our product, we are using aluminum as a panels, interior and exterior, exterior and exterior interior panels. And it's lightweight, long lasting, and free of rust. It has a specific gravity of, uh, of aluminum is around 2.0 or one third that of iron, and it's completely recyclable, so it's easy to recycle. The uh, insulating materials that we use is uh, polystyrene. It has low water absorption, resulting in longer life. And then the uh, foaming agent or the blowing agent used during the extrusion process of the polystyrene foam is ozone friendly. Uh, this is for polystyrene foam from approved soy sources of Nippon Fruhoff of Japan. So if you look at what is the advantage of, be, of being a local manufacturer? Since the insulated sandwich panel is locally manufactured, then the manufacturer can trim the panels to the exact sizes needed. So you could actually you don't need to wait for importation because you could do it on the spot and you could come up with an eight foot to 32 foot uh, uh, panel right there and then. And then manufacturer can easily mix and match the ref van body with any truck brand or model and ref system preferred by the customer. And then since there is no more waiting time due to importation, delivery can be as fast as seven days only for retail in Metro Manila. So if you're introducing a new technology in the Philippines or in the automotive industry, there are typical entry barriers. Like number one, there's a resistance because they are not yet, the market is not yet familiar with the product. They are not familiar with the technology. How does it work? So they are afraid of risking hundreds of thousands of pesos on a product that they are not sure would work well. No? So we need, therefore need to do intensive product knowledge seminar to our staff and to account executives of our dealers. And then we need to spend more in advertising and marketing to gain product acceptance. We need to look at our production, whether there's going to be production changes. Are we going to retool our facilities? Are we going to revise our production process and flow? If so, then we have to educate our staff on new production process and quality control parameters. Number seven, we of course have to maintain an inventory of new materials and parts. And number eight, which is very, very important, is after sales service nationwide. We have to educate our dealers about the new product, how to maintain and service and repair it. 
And then, of course, we have to provide them with spare parts support. So let me close by introducing to you our company, Central Nippon Fruit of Coltec Have Inc. you heard the new red bag manufacturer in the Philippines? Big Belisario. And today, ipapakita ko sa inyo ang aming bagong planta, ang Centro Nippon Fruit of Coltec Inc. or CFCI. This is our newest joint venture with two of the leading truck body manufacturers in the industry, Nippon Truhoff Company Limited of Japan and Truhoff Mahajak Company Limited of Thailand, where we are the majority shareholder. Our partnership natin with Nippon Truhoff actually started in 2016 with the exclusive distributorship of Wing Group Band Bodies. Ang CFCI ay binigyan ng pioneering status <coughs> ng Board of Investment and certified by the Department of Science and Technology being the first and the only local company to manufacture temperature-controlled band bodies in the Philippines. This is our CFCI manufacturing plant with our high-tech equipment. From our unboiler machines to our insulated sandwich panel processes. This is where it all comes together. Matapos makumpleto ang iba't ibang body parts, dito ina-assemble ang ating Tooltech Prep Band Body. Ang ginagamit nating insulating material ay XPS or Extruded Polystyrene Foam which has lower thermal conductivity at water absorption and best of all, environment friendly. For our exterior panel, we are using coated aluminum sheet, which has better surface appearance and flexibility. Lightweight din siya and 100% recyclable. One of the outstanding features of our Kultec Ref Band is the 9-key lock na kaya ni operate ng isang kamay. Dahil locally manufactured, meron tayong capacity and competency to do customized specification with faster delivery schedule. The only refrigerated band body in the Philippines with Japan quality standards and environment friendly. Full tech prep band. For more information, visit our Facebook page at Full Tech Prep Band and our website at www.fulltechprepband.com. Thank you very much, uh, Devin. Uh, that would be all. Thank you very much, everyone. If you have any question, uh, I have there my email address. You could email me, and I would be happy to, uh, to respond to you immediately. Thank you, Devin. That would be all. Thank you very much, Bong. Very good presentation. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, we are happy to take questions uh, in the after our final speaker. So thank you very much for your presentation. We are eager to, to, to learn more about your activities on the ground. And of course, it's always here that this is locally assembled, locally manufactured technology. So thank you again for your presentation. And we will move on to our next speaker. You're most welcome, uh, Before that, I would like to say thank you to our speakers because they are very dedicated this time. We have speakers joining from the Eastern Time US, uh, which is, I believe, 9 p.m., uh, now close to past 10 p.m., actually. And uh, we also have Philip is joining from Europe, and there is, uh, I believe, now 3 a.m. in the morning. So uh, very dedicated speakers, and, and we thank you all. So Philip, uh, can you please join us? Uh, Philip is a CEO and the founder of Product Blocks. And uh, he will talk about the rather disruptive technology uh, that is uh, fully sustainable. Uh, it's really the zero emission, the, the, I would say, the, the goal of the industry that, that we all aim at. So, Philip, can you please introduce us uh, what you are working on? What is the concept that you are uh, trying to bring to the industry and, and what's the progress? So, very much looking forward to, to hearing about your technology and your uh, current progress. Hi, everyone from my side. I hope that you can hear me well. And yes. um, basically, as uh, 
Yeah, I already mentioned, so it's uh, 4 a.m. in the morning, so I'm not going to be loud since my kids are sleeping at home. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity to present what we are doing at Product Box, what, what we've achieved, what we've done. Um, and uh, I'll just start by sharing my screen and presentation Please. that uh, I've prepared for today. Okay, and then I'll just double check with you guys um, if you see what I'm sharing. So, I guess absolutely. And yes, we can see your screen. Uh, we can just go to full slide. screen that will be good to go. There you go. So, um, yeah, as, as I said before, so um, let me. Yeah, express my gratitude to 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 you know to present to present this uh, to you guys um, out there, and we've seen uh, really nice uh, presentations today uh, from Kier and uh, from Centro, uh, and I think that uh, our technology, what we've developed, uh, adds and fits really really nice to the discussed issues. Um, I was happy also that uh, some of the challenges that we were facing in the development and putting out there in the market were already mentioned both on refrigerant and on last mile transport. So it's a really nice uh, fit to the entire panel uh, today. Um, just a short uh, you know, introduction on product block. So our vision is at least to, product, to provide uh, the most reliable condition transport uh, of uh, foodstuffs, pharmaceutical products, or vaccines were mentioned also at zero emission operations. So meaning that um, we focused ourselves on uh, having both direct and indirect emissions um, here considered, uh, meaning that we are not addressing just um, the refrigerant side of the conditioning, but uh, we uh, chosen to uh, use electric vehicles for our purposes, at least in the first stage uh, of our developments. Uh, why we are doing that? Um, basically, um, the, also the, the hub that and the project that uh, he is being talked about today here uh, is goes from farm to fork and uh, about uh, different studies are you know, stating that, that around 700 million tons of food is uh, wasted out there. And basically, this is about uh, coming out of the fact that uh, it's uh, because of unreliable, reliable first and last mile transport. So, 37 of the percent uh, of the um, of the customers are considering the last mile transport, in particular in the pharma, in the medical stuff for delivery, but also in the food stuffs, is uh, is seen as the biggest risk <coughs> out there. And <coughs> last, but, last but not least, here. We have 13 million tons of CO2 greenhouse emissions that is coming from transport refrigeration out there today in the world. And uh, seeing having those three facts at least uh, drives us uh, here. And just a short introduction on ourselves. Um, um, as, as I was already introduced, we've, we've, I founded uh, Product Blocks uh, jointly with uh, the two gentlemen here depicted and um, basically uh, Product Blocks is a spin-off company from Leap Here. Uh, I guess that Leap Here is known. Uh, we are seated in Vienna and not from the Leap Here commercial refrigeration as you know it, but Leap Here transportation system since Leap Here transportation um, is developing HVAC units so or climatization is only from the railway. For the railways, but also um, I'm not if uh, the community in Philippines or uh, also globally is aware of the new market entry from Libya Transportation. They've entered the transport refrigeration market for long haulage, uh, and uh, the unit that was developed uh, was developed by uh, Dominic and myself, and all the patents there. And we decided, and we see the huge opportunity to enter the last mile market here uh, with natural refrigerants and that's why we founded product blocks. Um, what drives us uh, once again um, was already mentioned before by the colleagues, uh, at least in, the, in Europe, we have the air gas regulation that we are also pushing for um, more ambitious goals here. Uh, and if you take a look on the left, left hand side, uh, 10 kilos of 404A out there um, is 
so in the in the atmosphere equals the annual fuel consumption of 14 cars more or less um, and of course this is just uh, you know uh, visuals how to how to how to see that and how to have a feeling about it what does it mean for the atmosphere and uh, on the other side in europe um, a strong bends of or strong bends not but the bends for cars uh, driven by diesel engines uh, are being introduced in the, in the city, inner, inner city areas and at the end of the day, so we have all the acoustic emissions, uh, emissions uh, and um, basically the foodstuffs and um, I'll, I'll say foodstuff because the, the pharmaceutical product is slightly different, uh, are being transported 3 a.m. So they're starting right away in Europe. So it's here 4 a.m. now. So they're starting right away uh, with the deliveries. And if you have a really um, loud um, refrigerator units outside on the vehicle where the vehicle has to run on the diesel power while conditioning uh, the food and they are delivering um, the, the people and the citizens are not that happy um, and those are the three drivers that uh, we've seen as opportunity and to enter this market and uh, provide the best solution out there. So basically, uh, when we are talking about the last mile transport refrigeration or temperature controlled delivery, uh, there, is, there are some pains out there in the market. So um, coming from the user, so and the, the biggest one is a thermal intrusion, meaning that uh, you have six to eight door openings in an hour. So if you're opening the refrigerator at home and the household refrigerator that much, uh, you'll know what's happening. Um, and basically all this latent heat and moisture that's entering the cargo space needs to be, you know, um, a solutions are needed. And then you have the cargo monitoring, uh, the proof of the cold chain that's uh, really uh, consistent. And um, as was mentioned before, the regulatory compliance or technology uh, that uh, acceptability that it's not known and what's happening and why and this and that. Uh, and last but not least, of course, the human failure that uh, somehow needs to be solved. If you add on the, on the, in, the, in the pot something else that's coming from the e-mobility perspective and uh, light commercial vehicles <laughs> driven by batteries, um, then you're putting even more um, issues out there. Uh, the first one is driving range. Can I, can I finish my job? Yes or no? No, that's all. it's not that quite clear, uh, different battery packs, different, uh, you know, the, the batteries are uh, acting totally different on different uh, environmental conditions and charging situations and so on. And um, in last mile, what we've learned at least uh, from our experience at the beginning, uh, the biggest problem was uh, not anymore the driving range, but um, the payload. Uh, since the, the vehicles are limited to 3.5 tons, I mean, there's an extension if you're using electric vehicle to 4.2 tons on extra load. Um, the weight added, the mass added on the vehicle coming from the insulation, as we've seen before from center or an end, the refrigeration unit is essential. So, um, and then there are other several aspects coming from the immobility. And what is our solution? So basically uh, what we've done, we, as I said before, so we want to put out the solution that is zero emission in operation. So a real zero emission in operation and for electric fleets. But the solution of course is um, tailored for e-mobility, but uh, it's also available and providing basically same efficiency also for diesel engines, once you are driving this um, uh, with an alternator that's plugged on the diesel engine. Um, the refrigerant, A290, we've learned that is uh, a high flammable. Uh, today from the first presentation, uh, that's totally correct. So we have the A3 uh, refrigerant here, and this is what we've managed at Product Blocks uh, to handle that one. Um, I'll show you afterwards uh, how um, this uh, happened. So why we've chosen R290 um, as a, a refrigerant in our system is because it has the best volumetric efficiency. Um, meaning that having the best volumetric efficiency um, is uh, providing the required capacity, refrigerant cooling capacity, 
uh, that is needed on one side. On the second, uh, on the, the second point of that um, is that uh, we can build the unit really compact and really lightweight. Um, one challenge was uh, to be solved. That was the flammability issue. Um, as I don't know if you guys are uh, and ladies are here, know that um, that um, the charge for per system was raised or is going to be raised hopefully soon officially to 500 uh, gram uh, per system. Uh, currently is 150, and we really achieved to have uh, lower than 100. So the, the objective was 125 grams. Uh, we are ru running now at 130 something uh, with uh, some measurement equipment inside, increasing um, the refrigerant charge and the volumes where the uh, refrigerant is flowing. Um, what we add on top that was also mentioned before um, from Mr. Cruz that um, basically uh, monitoring uh, not only of the cargo space, but also of the entire system is really important. So what we've developed is a, is a digital replica. So it's uh, basically uh, data enhanced. So we are getting a lot of information out of the unit um, online uh, in the system. And there is a virtual replica, so simulation model, if you want to say so. Uh, running in parallel that is providing you with the performance of the unit uh, in more or less real time or uh, on um, demand. So I'm coming out of the refrigeration system since we are talking about trans refrigeration today, basically and uh, how, uh, what are the, the, the key facts here. Um, it's a fully electric system, meaning that uh, we have a fully um, controllable RPMs, both on the compressor side and on the fence, um, from basically from zero to 100%. Um, then the system fully hermetic, uh, I'll come back later to that, uh, what fully hermetic means, uh, how uh, is defined by standards and by ourselves. Um, it's a low GVP, so it's of three, uh, meaning that one gram out in the atmosphere means three CO2 equivalents. And basically the weight decrease uh, was what we've achieved and that we are really proud of it is 35% um, and we have in part load condition up to 20% efficiency increase uh, because we have all these uh, degrees of freedom as I mentioned before. Um, one aspect that, that I didn't mention, uh, and it's really important since that came, that question came out also in the Q&A session, but also uh, in, from the panel, um, is uh, basically propane due to its uh, refrigerant properties. It's, I mean, it's not a miracle, it's not a black magic, um, it's just because of the thermodynamical properties. Uh, can be operated at high temperature without any decrease of capacity. That's, you can see just in the pH diagram where the critical temperature is really high up there. And this is a huge benefit, of course, uh, compared to other refrigerants where you uh, have um, um, oil issues and also you don't have any um, heat exchange area in the two phase uh, of the pH diagram or TS diagram. And this is a quite uh, huge benefit also for uh, other applications than refrigeration. Um, how uh, we've solved the issue, basically, I mean, it's, as I said, as I said before, it's not rocket science and um, is someone just needs to do that, uh, basically, is that we don't have any propane inside the compartment that's uh, under the closed doors. I do agree that the propane is a flammable, um, but um, the, the likelihood that um, the ignition and all the three factors that I'll, call, I'll, I'll talk later on uh, has to happen is really, really low. So it's 10 uh, to the power of minus nine, <laughs> uh, according to the system and the architecture that we've developed at least. And basically that the vehicle burns, uh, the likelihood is 10 to the power of minus six. So uh, a diesel vehicle will burn earlier than the unit uh, and the refrigeration system as well. And also, or it's gonna ignite. 
at least. And uh, there are studies in the US that uh, um, the, that, that confirms that the 10 over minus six uh, is the likelihood that uh, uh, the vehicle uh, could shoot uh, or should not, but uh, could burn other. Uh, at least what we've done here, so you see on the right-hand side um, is that uh, the propane and the refrigeration unit is a compact unit that is plug and run, basically. So you have uh, a hermetic system uh, with low than three gram uh, leakage per year. Um, all the pipings and everything is soldered together and um, is filled, pre-filled um, and delivered like that. Uh, so everything that you need to do is just mount it on the on the front wall or on the on the roof of the of the van, and basically you have then pipings coming out um, uh, towards the inner unit, uh, known as evaporator unit or whatever it is. But it's our evaporator is uh, contained in the compact unit out there, uh, and we have a secondary loop uh, containing glycol. Uh, uh, knowing that we are losing efficiency here because you have another heat exchange um, step. Um, but uh, as was mentioned before, acceptability, flammability uh, are the keywords here um, that we just uh, solved the issue, getting everything out of the uh, closed compartment where uh, basically the flammability energy uh, the, or of um, propane is really, really low uh, compared to the pressure energy that you will have and that could harm uh, people and, and so on. And um, by doing so, uh, we've solved, uh, from our point of view, um, a big issue here. Um, uh, and compared to the global warming potential between the solutions, what you have is our solution versus the current solution that was mentioned before that are basically using uh, HFCs and or uh, HFOs um, is, you can see the digits here. So <laughs> NLCO2 leakage equivalents are in three digit kilos per year. Uh, since we do know, uh, but the direct drive driven system uh, by the diesel engine, they're uh, firstly not hermetic. Uh, you, you will have you refill uh, refrigerant uh, every year. Um, there are about the studies are saying uh, or officially saying that this is a 17 percent to 20 percent leakage rate by just driving the system. And uh, if you do it, if you do the math, the indirect and direct emissions coming from the refrigeration unit are comparable to the one that just the car is producing. And um, Having said that, uh, we do believe that um, by the likelihood and the manageable system, at least in the car, you have also a tank that is flammable. You are driving diesel. Uh, it, it can burn as well and is burning in, in the engine inside uh, that uh, if you solve, um, as we've solved at least, uh, the homework of uh, flammability, uh, the benefits are enormous. Um, how we've done that? Uh, the hazard analysis uh, on that, uh, the, basically you will have to have a leak present. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the system is hermetic driven. Uh, it's outside uh, of the vehicle where you basically constantly have uh, ventilations, um, but also uh, you will need uh, a, a intelligent control strategy and driving um, startups procedures and everything that you will have. Uh, you know, driving the fans and so on and so on within the, within the unit. Uh, you will need a source of ignition. So uh, just a flammable mixture, that's the ratio, these are um, the stoichiometric uh, ratio between air and refrigerant has to be given. And then you will have, then you will have also a source ignition. So all these three uh, will happen, should happen at the same time um, in order to have a flammable mixture, which uh, basically today in the supermarkets, you have propane already installed. And this means if you're running with the cleaning machine in the supermarket, this can happen, right? Uh, but in transport refrigeration is a big issue uh, still. And um, we, we have also isobutan at, in our uh, cabinets and commercial uh, household refrigerators in each home of us, of ours. 
And uh, since the low charge is given there and we succeed also the low charge in the transport refrigeration um, and we've done our homeworks on the hazard uh, management and risk management of flammability, uh, we came to the likelihood and uh, to 10 of uh, minus nine. That means that we'll have to solve 1 billion units. Uh, so the likelihood can happen. Uh, I would be looking forward uh, to have that uh, impact uh, on sustainability, selling 1 billion uh, transport refrigeration units with uh, three CO2 GVP. And uh, as, we, as I've said before, uh, the harm coming out of that is uh, also manageable and really low compared to uh, other systems that we have uh, out there on the streets. Um, what we've done, we've done extensive uh, leakage tests uh, in order to um, eliminate or to minimize uh, this uh, um, uh, flammability concentrations within um, the unit. Uh, this was done uh, also with David Colburn. I think that uh, it's, uh, he's known uh, in the community um, also. Um, we developed jointly a system how to do that, uh, how to assess that. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, we found out uh, what are the potential ignition um, um, uh, components and subsystems within the unit. Basically, we've managed that um, with uh, providing uh, high sealed um, electronic box, let's put it that way. We've exchanged all the fuses. We don't have any fuse in the system. Basically, everything is happening uh, on a plate, on a platin where the, the ignition source are low there in a sealed, gas sealed um, box. Uh, and uh, we are using uh, where needed uh, ATEX certified uh, components. So ATEX, uh, meaning that um, they are uh, operational and they are um, basically ignition free, uh, if you want to say so. Um, this is just, uh, you know, showing off that uh, we at ProgLogs, we've run a bunch of tests, tests, uh, shocking vibrations. So uh, also uh, in operation, not in operation, just to, to, to assess also, uh, we'd installed uh, also sensors for on leakage, how to, to you know, we push the unit, uh, towards the limits um, in order to see uh, if uh, everything's going to work well. Um, and we've performed also uh, uh, intensive high temperature tests uh, and EMC tests and everything that's coming with a full electric unit, let's put it that way, uh, since we are operating also in a high voltage uh, area or we are transferring um, basically the high voltage to a low voltage for our unit. Um, we've done uh, our certification uh, procedures and process and everything, uh, fulfilling a bunch of uh, standards in Europe, test reports, uh, everything that's needed uh, in order to see, mark the unit and uh, run, drive on the streets. Uh, we've done that with TÜV Süd uh, in Germany jointly. And we're really happy that we got the certification and also the approval um, and that we fulfilled all the requirements uh, basically that are uh, needed uh, for that. Um, we've had uh, also our first e-vehicle integration. So this happened on uh, the Nissan e-in vehicle. It's a van that's converted basically by or enhanced the volume um, by a Slovakian um, European um, company, the name is Voltia, Voltia Van. Um, and basically this is just a schematics how uh, we've integrated that. Uh, basically out there in the market, uh, a lot of companies are uh, trying to install their units and they're using their own batteries and offering their own batteries. But as I said before, uh, coming from the user needs, uh, basically you're maximizing here the payload uh, by adding extra battery just for the refrigeration unit because um, the car manufacturers were, uh, they had their own requirements in order to plug in the unit to the traction battery of the car. 
um, since our system was developed right away for immobility, basically we are fulfilling these requirements and our control system communicates with the battery management system of the car, uh, providing soft starts uh, and different operational control strategies uh, um, that are basically not harming uh, the traction battery at all and providing uh, the requested power to the system to the operational management and to, uh, to the strategy of the vehicle itself. We have our own climatic chamber. We've done a bunch of tests. These are just some insights um, coming out there and some pictures uh, how this vehicle at least uh, is operated. We've done extensive, um, you know, uh, during the field test that we had uh, with in a real operational environment with uh, uh, I don't want to say yeah, basically they they have their own farm as well. It's a um, company producing um, under bio a label um, fruits, vegetables, and everything, and delivering straight to the end users, the customers, B two C, meaning um, they deliver from farm uh, straight to the end users who you can order that online nowadays here. Uh, that uh, is really convenient and they're pushing for that, that uh, they want uh, to be 100% sustainable and uh, eliminate any kind of emissions that are producing. So uh, they're leaving that uh, also in their uh, business operations. Uh, I mean, you see here the vehicle is the one also, I have to admit that an advantage. I mean, basically all the vans, the small vans, they have, uh, they're really low, and this vehicle uh, follows the, the, the concept that you can stand in the vehicle, which is really important for uh, the guys. I was happy that also uh, this re refrigeration uh, concept uh, for static use uh, was mentioned before. And this is also a project of ours that uh, we are contributing at the moment that uh, also static containers or um, they're naming here pick and collect places that are cold, uh, we are working that uh, to put propane also um, there. And also that um, there is a communication between the uh, transport companies and this uh, pick and place, pick and collect, pick and, uh, sorry, pick and collect uh, marketplaces. Um, the unit is uh, modular and scalable. Uh, what we were looking to as well in the design phase is that we can position uh, for high refrigeration capacity, if you're increasing or going towards trucks as well, um, to multiply the unit by just putting two next to each other so uh, and they don't harm themselves. And uh, by doing this, you have a redundant systems basically for a longer, um, a longer haulage um, that uh, you can provide uh, cooling uh, if uh, one of the units are not in operations. Uh, so basically the units uh, from the dimensions are, can be installed also next to each other also for demanding uh, higher refrigeration capacity but still fulfilling uh, uh, or minimizing the risk um, bounded to the use of uh, air 1290. Um, yeah, and uh, I was, while uh, Mr. Cruz was presenting, I was uh, generating this slide at the, at the same time uh, because I found um, uh, um, interesting maybe to share this experience as well with you guys um, here in the community, uh, at least in Austria, the, the, what we are trying to do here uh, with several end customers that are wholesalers for the foodstuffs um, that um, and are also in our sustainability uh, platform, let's put it that way, uh, that we are pushing forward is uh, the reuse of an insulated body in the refrigeration unit. So basically um, the systems are used for four years and then put uh, or sold or nobody knows what's happening with these vehicles. Uh, and when you come to electric immobility, this is also an issue. And uh, the goal is uh, to reuse at least the insulated body on the different chassis and we are working together uh, with several companies here in order to have an integrated uh, unit with the body uh, that is uh, lightweight uh, and uh, also 
by refurbishing some of the components and uh, maybe the unit. And we are using here a specific technology also for uh, how to, uh, to connect or joining technology basically um, to use uh, between, uh, I would say just uh, for a matter of uh, simplicity, plastics and uh, metals um in order to be uh, able to connect and uh, to optimize also the production first of the panels um, in the upfront and in the second stage also to reconnect that uh, on a different chassis um yeah so basically um summarizing everything that i've said before um what we have is we have a maximized payload by using the a sustainable, uh, from our point of view, one of the best refrigerant out there for the purpose. Um, it fits the purpose. Uh, the volumetric efficiency is high. It can be operated in a high ambient uh, regions. Uh, it's fully electric, fully hermetic, uh, and full digitalized. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, this digital twin um, and digitalization is providing a continuous information about the system and nudging uh, companies and users uh, to optimize um, the efficiency of it uh, and calculating continuously the um, asset uh, utilization or the rest value uh, or resale value, if you want to say so, of the system. Summarizing, um, and that's why uh, VS Product Blocks also joined uh, the Clean Cooling Coalition that's driven by Sheko. Uh, also pushing in Europe for more ambitious goals uh, on sustainability uh, is, um, and I'll just you know cite this because I like I, I, I loved the <laughs> the presentation template that uh, we got uh, is either we will move jointly to a low carbon world because the nature will force us, and I hope that all these um, events uh, that are happening there are worrying. Uh, from uh, hurricanes, tsunamis, and everything. I mean, the Philippines region is also the Asian region uh, hit by those. Um, and hopefully we can manage that um, by ourselves. And hopefully the, the nature will not force us to do that or politics uh, will guide us and introduce because the solutions are out there. We've seen before Carrier has a CO2 solution and I'm sure Carrier has also other uh, R&D projects and pipelines that uh, are driving for sustainability. Also the other manufacturers there, uh, once you're doing patent research, you come out with those information um, that uh, everybody's looking uh, and they have the technologies there. Um, what we need here is um, a more ambitious way uh, to scale up the use of natural refrigerants and sustainable solutions out there because as I said, um, the technologies are there. We just need to pick them up and deploy them and uh, hopefully uh, craft a smarter planet for each, each area of one, each one of us. Thank you very much. So I, I mean, at the end, hopefully I didn't talk too much uh, because I haven't seen when did I start. Philip, thank you very much. Uh, fantastic presentation. It's four past in the morning in Europe and you have stayed with us for the whole event. And not only you have also edited your slides live during the show. So Lightly, yeah. fantastic thank job. Thank you very much. And, and you know, you have addressed the safety of Arch90 when it comes to the leakage and uh, flammability and your, your, your measurements put in place. There's a lot of stigma when it comes to r and its vulnerability. So addressing this is proactively is, is definitely the, the right way forward. So thank you for including it. I have uh, two brief questions before we move on to the panel and Devin will uh, moderate the, the, the following Q&A. You have mentioned your pilots. Uh, do you also have some initial first data on the energy performance uh, as, as we uh, believe that uh, r 90 should be much more efficient solution over the 134A? Could you please comment on that? We have that, uh, we have that and we'll be happy to, to share that information also with you guys on the Atmo Europe. So because we will uh, providing a use case study there uh, for Atmo Europe. Um, basically, yes, we have those. Um, the problem is a, a problem. It's not a problem. Uh, the question is, uh, as I mentioned before, our data shows 20% uh, more efficiency, but this is, you know, it's, it's not just because of the refrigerant itself. Uh, once you're pushing uh, the system uh, to the limits or, or because everything that you're stating in the transport refrigeration 
is basically highest power, you know, peak power, peak refrigeration capacity that we have, and everybody's trying to measure that coming uh, out of it. So uh, our uh, initial so, uh, in our system, because we have a slightly efficiency decrease because of the secondary loop, right? This is given, so we are not gonna hide that or everybody knows that this is, uh, the, it could be the case. And as I said, so in part load conditions, uh, according to our analysis, we are 20% 20 per, 20 more efficient than the current solution. Um, this has, this is bound, this is coupling the strategy, the, the operational strategy during the door openings, basically because we are making here an advantage out of the uh, thermal capacity of the glycol cycle as well. So we are benefiting in part load condition for having a um, glyc glycol, glyc so not a direct evaporating, evaporation, but uh, the secondary loop. And when it comes to terms of the peak power, uh, we are more efficient than 100, when the, the HF South boat 404 as well, and uh, HFCs, and uh, this is accounting uh, in uh, basically nine to ten percent. So this is the in, the in the peak power. So, but we will present those uh, information uh, in more detail by our CTO uh, during the Atmo. Great. So this is an invitation for everyone to join also our event in in, in Brussels uh, in September. Uh, a final quick question, uh, Philip. You have mentioned the, the initial pilot projects. And these are taking place in Europe. Are you looking for collaboration in other markets globally? Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, basically, um, um, as um, I said before, so our unit is plug and run. So basically, we can deliver the unit um, around the world. We are looking for corporations uh, as well, uh, both on uh, more piloting of the solution uh, to show the benefits because uh, and we are pretty happy because uh, we started last year with the piloting the project and we already, uh, from the pilot customers, we have already the first orders as well, uh, which is uh, really motivating us uh, to do more first piloting and this is the way forward for our, for our solutions and uh, also globally. So uh, basically we are looking also for partners, um, I'm just open for that as well to discuss uh, for market uptake in um, different countries. Thank you very much, Philip. And with that, I would like to ask Devin to uh, start our uh, Q&A session with all the presenters. Hello, hello. Okay, one second. Uh, can, can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, you guys, got, give a thumbs up. That would be great. Clearly, clearly. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Philip, Bong, and Suresh, Thank you so much for your presentations. And just to give a, a little bit of recap uh, for everybody, um, you know, this, uh, this is a te technical training workshop on advanced technologies for transport refrigeration. Um, and it's, it's so great to just kind of cover, so, sort of see that whole uh, chain of the different applications and different um, types of technologies that are used throughout the transport sector, everything from the reefer containers, you know, going on ships and then going on, on trucks and then even being used as static storage units uh, to um, like commercial vehicles and getting into e-mobility and, and electric vehicles. Um, and then central with your insulation, using some of the latest technologies for insulation in your, in your uh, factory and your new initiative uh, launching um, recently, uh, building these units lo locally and uh, getting these local technicians involved is, uh, is very interesting. So we have uh, a bunch of questions here that I'd like to address and um, I'd, I'd also open up the floor to any of the participants who are um, watching and like to answer a question, just go ahead and raise your hand and you know, we'll get you on, on speaker uh, directly, that would be great. So first of all, I'd like to just uh, start with some of the questions that we already addressed in the Q&A, just to kind of get uh, you to speak to them a little bit. I know you've all already answered them, but uh, one we, we didn't address, uh, Suresh, this question is from Federico Figueroa. Um, question about how feasible in the Philippine setting is solar PV system connected to outdoor carrier container used in, as an alternative storage? So I think you addressed this a little bit, but maybe if you could speak a little bit more sure. about. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I uh, quickly looked up what the solar uh, uh, radiation is. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this that I shared. Yes, you can see it. Uh, it's uh, on the DOE. Uh, government Philippines website. It's in publication. You can see 
it shows the typical uh, radiation, solar radiation in the country of Philippines. And the summary says the average is somewhere around four and a half to five and a half kilowatt hour per day. So our typical unit <clears throat> for an average to maintain cargo is around uh, on the lower end of three, 3.2. Five is the average based on our modeling uh, kilowatt uh, consumption per hour. So on a 24 hour, it will be around 85 kilowatt hour. So if we bracket it and use this five kilowatt average radiation in Philippines, depending on where you install, uh, that's the power you get per square meter of panel. Uh, so assuming you have a good uh, model to track the solar and rotate it and get the maximum, uh, I think you would need somewhere around 15 to 20 uh, square meter panel to run a reefer unit sustained, uh, even uh, though you don't get uh, get uh, solar radiation during the nighttime. Uh, I think that should give you adequate power. Um, so I'm saying 15 to 20 square meters per per reefer unit. So that is possible, and that's kind of what. Uh, how I would address that question. I don't know if that answered the question clearly. Yeah, I think that is a very helpful information. Um, one thing that does bring to mind uh, for me is uh, some, something we've seen addressed in our past events and listening to our past speakers uh, in the Philippines, especially with this application. Uh, how much is uh, extreme weather a concern? I mean, if we have these outdoors in, in rural areas with typhoons and, and rains and storms coming multiple times every year. Um, is, there, is that a big concern? Is that something that can be overcome, a challenge? Uh, no, these are, uh, our units are designed for marine uh, use where the units are, uh, are installed in the deck of a ship, as you can see. And uh, they can hold constant list angles of 15 degrees as well as uh, seawater splashing on them. So the compressors are mounted a little higher and even if you have up to a feet of water, it can sustain run without any problem. So uh, rain should not be a problem at all. Um, yeah, and ambience I answered earlier, uh, up to 50 C, tested and designed, it'll work uh, perfectly fine. I don't see the ambient conditions being a problem. Definitely maintenance and stuff should be done. So you don't keep fouling the heat exchanger coils but those are standard, any units you need to do maintenance. You can't uh, install and walk away. So just like you mentioned at the end of your presentation, training is the biggest uh, challenge and the biggest focus. And yes, you know, yes. this is why um, you know, we are so focused here with the, the CCI Hub to, to tackle this issue. Uh, one more question from uh, Federico Figueroa that I want to address uh, for, for Bong from, uh, from Centro. Uh, he says, how significantly different is the product attribute mentioned XPS lightweight aluminum in comparison with the, your closest competitor, if any, in the Philippines. So if you could just tell us a little bit more about the, this, uh, this material for insulation and, and how it's uh, unique. Yeah, for XPS, it's uh, polystyrene-based compared to polyurethane PU. The advantage here is that the, the uh, XPS has a lower water absorption capability, and therefore it absorbs less water, and therefore it results into longer life. This is very significant for us because we Filipinos have a habit of cleaning our vehicles at least once or twice a week using water and sometimes chemicals. So this is very important because it rapidly deteriorates whatever insulation that you use if this is contaminated. It is it, if this absorbs the water that you use for washing the vehicle. For the uh, panels that we use, it's aluminum. It's uh, basically, uh, it's lighter compared to other metals. It doesn't rust, it's longer lasting. And uh, of course, uh, it is completely recyclable. So those materials that we use for our products are basically the ad advantages that we have over most of our competitors. But I think our advantage is not much, it's other than the advantages in the product. We also have added advantage because we are the only local assembler. And therefore, as local assemblers, we can uh, exactly cut uh, the, uh, the panels that we produce out of production line exactly to the size that we need. We don't have to import if we need a, a particular size. And then we can mix and match uh, the size of the body compared to versus the truck brand or the truck model that and even the ref system that the customer prefers so we can re, we can engineer our products to mix and match the body the truck brand and model 
and the rough system. Then finally, because we don't have to wait for importation time, we could deliver in as fast as seven days so you could easily get your products immediately, a rough band, and start using it for your business and start earning early on the product that you bought. Yeah, great answer. I mean, uh, a lot of advantages there, so uh, pretty pretty clear to see. Um, one more question actually from uh, Federico. Um, and this is uh, Federico, you're, you're from the, the Philippines and one of the uh, key members of the, the industry and in the, in the cold storage industry in the Philippines. So this question is addressed to Philip. I uh, just want to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on the feasibility, operational and financial for the use of electric vehicles in delivering goods to the market. So Federico here says in the Philippine setting, typically a vehicle capacity of one to two to three tons is used in the cold chain to deliver goods operating in 48 hours average multi-drop set up in NCR, which is the national capital region, meaning Manila, the, uh, the main, the capital of, uh, of the Philippines. Um, could you speak to this a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I was writing the answer on that. I'll, I'll just send it afterwards as well. Um, so you have to get written. Uh, thanks for the question. So basically, um, let's start from the operational side. So the, the entire system uh, is specified for six, six stops per hour for 10 hours uh, operations or 10 hour operations. So uh, basically, this is what uh, the entire system, at least uh, in the specification that we have uh, here and that uh, we developed, uh, this, is the, this is the case. So uh, 10 hours operation, uh, cooling operation with uh, at least six stops, um, uh, meaning the door comes twice, <laughs> uh, will be opened um, per hour. And um, this is what is performing. Um, basically, um, the, our piloting tests that we had uh, were done in uh, two cities, so Vienna and Linz. So Vienna is a two million city. Basically, uh, the delivery was, uh, coming outside from the city, in the city. And uh, the, the, the driving range uh, in Vienna was, um, so the, the, the drivers that had less than 150 kilometers per day uh, with an electric vehicle. And uh, they've succeed in delivering their job and doing their job. So uh, the refrigeration unit, of course, it's a full system, right? You have the electric vehicle, you have the, the refrigeration system and you have the insulation. Uh, that plays a significant role as well. Um, then the, it's, the driving range was uh, affected by the refrigeration just by 7% uh, in total in uh, these delivering conditions, meaning that only 15 kilometers driving range was uh, basically affected by that. And uh, this was, it was fully uh, okay uh, and uh, feasible for the end customers. When you come to financials, and basically that was done, I have to mention that with a 40 kilowatt hours battery. And basically the new vehicles coming on the market, they're aiming for doubling the capacity of the battery. So in the same um, payload excellence. And so the new vehicles, at least uh, available in Europe coming from the PSA and from um, uh, Fiat are having batteries with more than 70 to 78 kilowatt hours. So it's doubling the capacity. You cannot linearly double the driving range, but basically the driving range is going really up as well. So uh, we are expecting driving ranges up to 250 kilometers with uh, electri electrified refrigerated vehicle. When you come to financials, uh, interesting aspect, at least um, uh, the policies, uh, I can say, so I don't know how it's in Philippines, but at least in Austria and uh, neighboring countries here, uh, there are huge subventions once you are uh, up, you switching to immobility, coming from infrastructure point of view. Uh, so basically, if you're doing it right, and this is what we are trying to do for the customers in a package as well, uh, since we knowing here the funding uh, authorities and subventions that are for the transition, uh, enabling the transitions. So uh, basically, you have the most most free of charge. Uh, charging stations on your uh, side, <laughs> if you're doing that correctly. And basically, uh, we've calculated that uh, per kilometer for electric vehicle, you're paying 20 cents uh, um, in, in euros, right? 20 cents per kilometer, which is cheaper uh, currently or in the next two or three years uh, than buying a, a bike 
for uh, e-bike. Um, and saying, having said that, um, it's uh, at least now the market situation in Europe is really promising and promoting uh, the transition to sustainable solutions and to electric vehicles. This does not does not does not mean that it's going to stay like this, right? Because um, on the on a financial point of view, you have to be competitive, competitive, and this is where uh, scale can help. Thank you, Philip. Um, you know, it's interesting because having the three of you all here right now, you could sort of start to really see. Um, you know, of course, in operation, it's 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 going to be uh, there are going to be challenges, but theoretically, I mean, you could have these solutions lined up and, and with uh, the technology expertise have a, a full, um, very low emission uh, transport refrigeration sector. Um, Hilda, actually, uh, I saw you raise your hand. Uh, I'd just like to open the floor to you. Would you like to ask a question? No, actually, I'm just going to call your attention. I, uh, that uh, Carlo Enriquez has been raising his hands uh, since a while ago, so maybe we could uh, give him the floor. Yes, perfect. So I was about to uh, uh, allow uh, Carlo to talk, so I'll, I'll let you, Talk, Carlo, actually, if you could introduce yourself uh, very quickly and ask your question, that would be great. So here you go, go ahead. Looks, uh, looks like, Carlo, are you with us? The it looks like the microphone Probably is mute. Up. Is it mute? Yeah. He's connected, yeah, but is like... mute? Yeah, Carlo, you are muted. Um, if you could unmute your mic. In a few seconds, okay. No, no, no worries. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to you. Um, one second. Okay, so um, yeah, let me just uh, see if we can... Uh, actually, one uh, thing I wanted to ask here was um, for any of the panelists, um, you know, Philip and, and Bong and, and Suresh, I just wanted to, to see if you guys had any questions for each other. With, uh, you know, that would be great to see if we could have uh, some, some interaction or some, some questions. Uh, would you guys uh, like to ask any? Yeah, sure. Uh, I have a quick question uh, for Roberto. Um, yes. It's just a simple question. You mentioned about uh, uh, ozone-friendly extruder polystyrene. Uh, can you tell what the foaming agent is and its uh, global warming potential, if, if uh, you do have it handy? According to the material that we received from our partner, Nippon Fro in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, the, in the process of uh, producing the polystyrene, they have to use a foaming agent or blowing agent, and according to them, the foaming or blowing, the blowing agent that they're using is ozone friendly. And uh, I'm not at liberty to give you the suppliers, but one is an American supplier and two Japanese suppliers. Yeah, do you know the GWP? Areas. Just curious. I have no, I have no details of those okay. in the material. Yeah, because it's us. very common now to get uh, close to zero GWP. I'm oh, okay, just okay. curious, that's all. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you for this, this comment or uh, question from Suresh, because I think this is maybe another opportunity for, for additional technology transfer to help address this ozone friendly sometimes uh, really relates to HFCs that can be uh, uh, causing the climate uh, climate change. So it would be great if we may uh, help connect the industries and address this, this uh, topic as well, if relevant. So it's great to see that there are technologies that are basically uh, GWP zero or one that can be used for the forming agents. So uh, very good, very good comment and question. Yeah, I have Anybody question. else from the audience? Philip, please go yeah, ahead. I have a question for Suresh. Um, basically, um, out of curiosity as well, uh, since I was developing the transport refrigeration unit for Leap here, coming on the market for the long haulage, for the long semi-trailers, right? Um, are there any plans um, on carrier side to introduce the CO2 technology also so transfer the technology to the trailers, semi-trailers? Uh, yes, uh, we in fact have a product which uh, some of our customers in France are using, testing, trialing. So yes, there is. Uh, the capacity requirements for trailer obviously is higher because they you have thinner walls. Um, so yes, there we use two compressors and a, a souped up system to deliver the required capacity. Yes, we have. Yeah. Let me have a question. Uh, in the Philippines right now, uh, yes. the, uh, the technicians that we deal with in the automotive industry with respect to refrigeration is uh, are more familiar with the R134 and the R404. Just in case we do introduce something like a natural refrigerant, what is the training very extensive that we need to, to subject uh, them to? 
um, no, like I mentioned, there's a slide there mentioned in my presentation. The training is not very extensive. Most of the people who took the training mentioned that um, it was a myth to that thinking that it was very difficult to handle high pressure refrigerant. It's not because the systems are designed to manage that pressures. Um, you just need to use different components. Like when you brace a tube, uh, the copper to copper, you need to use the thicker wall tubes that are available. The standard are like uh, 20 or 30 thousands, I'm um, mentioning in inches. Uh, these are more like 50, 55 uh, thousands uh, thickness. So uh, the thicker wall refrigeration tubes are available, may not be readily available in global locations, but when you go and uh, look for uh, classified thick wall copper tubes, you'll see that that's kind of what we are using. Um, but uh, from a use case of the unit itself, it's just uh, some of the software is different. Uh, but a lot of the components, the fundamental system is very similar. It uses a wrap condenser. Uh, it's called gas cooler there. And uh, it's not difficult. And we have online training, which a lot of the technicians could take to get themselves familiarized. And we provide certification as well once they finish the training. So we could give uh, a special training if needed uh, using our service uh, 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 training group and provide that. In addition to the online efforts required, thank you, sir. We have a well, well uh, uh, mature online training available. Thank you, thank you. I have uh, a question for all the panelists uh, with the aim to wrap up this this webinar. But uh, let's let's dream a little bit, or or let's try to forecast uh, ahead. How long uh, do you believe it will take for us to move the transport refrigeration to be fully sustainable? Uh, let's let's focus on the refrigerant itself. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's let's set the threshold of ninety percent. So ninety percent of all transport refrigeration technology to be powered by natural refrigerants. How many years this uh, may take, in your opinion? That would be a difficult question uh, to answer. It's uh, you asking us to uh, buy a lottery ticket and say. <laughs> It's going to win. It's not that way, quite uh, that way. But I think the regulations, uh, they are starting to look, like I mentioned to you, uh, they're starting to look into the GWPs and they are driving that down. Uh, currently, there are no uh, A1 refrigerants below uh, 500 other than the natural refrigerants. So it is taking a little bit, but I'm sure uh, the synthetic refrigerants they all have a certain negative effect to the earth um, because uh, I mean if you research you will notice that they all have a certain impact uh, due to the synthetic chemicals they have so uh, clearly a drive to the natural refrigerant will happen uh, it's trying to predict the time is a little bit difficult uh, I we feel that in the next three to five years there will be a drastic change but if you try to put a 90% uh, conversion, that would be a difficult one to say, but definitely between the three to five years, we think that there'll be a drastic change in the landscape, moving to natural refrigerant. I don't know if the other panelists have some comments based on their experience. Yeah, I can add on that. So as I said in my last statement, so the technologies are there uh, and this is what upsets me uh, personally. Uh, I have to say that Technologies are available and they need a rollout. They need uh, market uptake. They need uh, acceptance, awareness, trainings. Uh, and yeah, um, if we don't have, uh, as the statement from Ms. Gutierrez was, um, <laughs> if the policy makers and the politics are not pushing for that, uh, of course, the all of these scale-up solutions are the most economical ones, right? Um, currently for the companies only, but if you uh, address the entire system uh, and the results coming of not sustainable solutions out on the market, um, the planet, the countries are in pain. And um, that's why I need that they have to have a hand on that. And that's why we are pushing for more ambitious goals when it comes to bans and taxations and so on and so on, and uh, to enable this rollout. Uh, my expectation is uh, we will push hard uh, to implement that by so to, to transfer at least the last mile transports towards um, sustainable solutions 
latest 2030, right? Uh, but I'm not that optimistic that globally uh, till 2050 and beyond 90% uh, of the solutions will be sustainable, unfortunately. In my presentation, I presented eight uh, typical entry barriers for new products and looking at the, uh, what, we're present, what we're going to do, 90%. I think all of those eight uh, entry barriers that I presented would be true. And considering the extent that we need to do, the uh, distribution and the uh, training that we need to do, uh, considering the Philippines, there are about uh, 1,600 cities, municipalities, all of them with dealerships. You have to, so it's very difficult for us really to, to do all of these things. So I'm looking at maybe, as I agree with Suresh, it's, not, I mean, it's going to be about minimum five years, but of course it will be accelerated with any international pressure that's applied or even local legislation. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your for your predictions. Uh, I believe uh, the, the, the growth in the sector of technology transport and deployment of sustainable technologies is going to take place over the next uh, next year. So we will see the uptake. Let's hope it will be uh, fairly substantial. Uh, with that, I would like to say thank you very much to all of you for joining us today. I think we had a fantastic event and, and great content being presented towards the not only the, the Filipino industry, but the global audience that join us today. Uh, we hope that we can uh, work with you on the, the Culture Innovation Hub uh, on, on these exciting technologies and deploying them on the ground in the Philippines and really introducing the best that is out there you know, for, for the sector. So thank you again uh, for contributing to this particle event and we definitely hope to be working with you on an ongoing basis and, and look forward to, to seeing more and more similar technologies deployed in the sector and, and beyond. So thank you again uh, from my head. Devin, if you want any, any, any parting words as well, please. No, um, excuse me, Gilda, uh, Hilda, um, thank you also for joining us. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, if we have any questions, uh, people can reach out to Hilda as well, to Jan, uh, to myself. Um, thank you to our three panelists and uh, thank you to all of us, uh, all of you for joining us today. Uh, with that, we'll wrap it up. Yeah, thank you everyone Devin, for giving us the opportunity and time. Devin, there are new questions in the Q&A. Could you just pass out them to so could answer them in writing? Yes, definitely. So we will uh, gather these questions, we'll forward them to you all, and then we'll make sure to reach out and um, get these questions answered uh, specifically. And then also we'll, we'll be posting information on our website as well. So, and we'll, uh, we'll be um, releasing this webinar, all the, all the details uh, in the next few days. So keep an eye out for that. And um, yeah, we'll be in touch. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Cheers, guys.